You guys, it's Sunday, it's December 5th, it's 2010, and this is Day 9 Daily number 222. <gasps> I missed you so much, I took a week off after DreamHack, in which I did the following. I paid rent, that's good. I got there eventually, it didn't happen on the 1st, but the rent did eventually arrive in my manager's uh, inbox. I rearranged some furniture, you're gonna notice, <gasps> there's a bookshelf! There's a bookshelf, and of course, um, we have uh, our good friend, Pito Bear, who's... <laughs> Who's uh who's hanging out on the bookshelf and it says no one likes a tattletale <laughs> so that's great big thanks to the fine individual who provided me that uh, at, at a recent tournament so that goes out to you uh, uh, in other exciting news I just rearranged my room I you even see my dressers there I tried to put it in my closet it barely fit and I was like yes and then I realized that I couldn't open the drawers because like the door was blocking it. So I just kind of took it back out again. But you'll even notice I have a new poster. Mm, it's only related to StarCraft because I am a one-dimensional individual. Uh, and of course, the other exciting news of the week was that I took the week off. Weirdly enough, I found out I was mortal at DreamHack, which was unfortunate. That I was like drinking like tons of energy drinks, like trying to stay awake. I was like, yeah, it's going to be so awesome. Because I wanted to have like the energetic, awesome cast. And I will say that that DreamHack tournament was... Like, absurdly good. Like, from every perspective. Like, the games actually got better over time. I don't know if this ever happened in your past when you're getting really pumped up for a finals. You're like, oh, it's going to be the most epic thing ever. And it's like a 3-0, one-sided, total Hulk smashing series. It's just like watching the Hindenburg in action. It's just unbelievable, not fun. Um, but that tournament was absurd. And the finals, of which was the like best series I think I've ever casted. Game 3 of Mana vs. Nama was the best game I think I've ever seen. I was I actually got so anxious during that game because it was so close, it was so tense, that when I screamed at one point in the game, I actually almost fainted. I was like, oh my god, he's moving in! Ah! And then my vision began to dim, and I just like started like hitting the Apollo. I like I started to get really dizzy. I was like punching, I was like, talk, talk, talk. I don't know if you can actually find it in the cast, um, because I don't actually remember it at the time, but like I was seriously my was like, like almost knocked out right there uh, on camera, which would have really been epic if I had like died and mana pulled, you know, the epic win. That would have been really, really the, probably the best tournament of all time. But after that week off of much, um, not quite yet relaxation, I had to do my mid-year thesis show, which is done now. So relaxation can maybe begin next week. In that week off, there were no dailies. Oh, how tragic. So this, this is the first ever daily back after DreamHack. If you haven't seen the DreamHack games, do it. Oh my god, watch. Like seriously, get your family. Uh, maybe the family cat and the dog can like sit on either side of you like it does on the postcards with the idealized family. Get those, like a glass of wine. Start with the first match and just blast right through all five of them. Ugh, it's so unbelievably good. Mana vs. Nama. Um, yeah, so now that I'm back, now that I'm back, we're just going to do a normal, regular, good old happy time daily today, where we're going to do an emphasis on a, on a, a Zerg player. Other than that, oh, I know you're as excited as my shirt to hear that news, because it's going to be all about Sen today in a game that he recently played against In Control. Now, the one thing that I really love about In Control is that he's super good at um, PvZ, like really, 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 really good. And I think too often when people, you know, perceive the idea of goodness, they, they get the idea that they're doing something really amazing, really incredible, that um, you, you just need to know the trick to sort of do. You know, like for instance, if any of you watched OGS MC against uh, July from the recent GSL match, MC was using Void Rays in every game, people would see it and go, oh, I whip out a Void Ray, and suddenly I can be in the round of 32 of GSL. Not quite. What's especially exciting about watching in control play is that he does the same stuff that everyone else does, the usual sort of stalker, sentry pushing, but it's his timing that comes out in a manner that really messes Zerg players up. Like, really, really, really badly. You know you little... You little uh, Protoss buddies who struggle with mass mutalisks just waltz in the back of your base and control does not have that problem, right? Really, really good. So when I saw this game, I was quite eager because the, the huge difficulty from the Zerg point of view that I feel is when you get the big Stalker Colossus ball. Um, and there's this idea that I'm going to talk about, which is having too big of a mid-game army. 
um, and, and how you end up coping with that. So we'll see that uh, in, in more detail uh, as we go directly into the game. Oh, it's so good to be back here on the Day 9 Daily where we learn to be a better gamer. And uh, for the live viewers who are tuning in beforehand, you also learned how to play Text Twist, which is like perhaps my favorite non-StarCraft game of all time. I play that game so much, and I can never get the five-letter words, and it drives me insane. But either way, we have in control spawning at the top position as the red Protoss. At the bottom, we have Sen playing under the ID softball as the blue Zergies. Now, uh, I think that everyone is kind of used to the idea that, um, that I have the sound off. I think everyone's used to that. I think everyone's used to me coming back after a week and realizing, oh no, the sensitivity is good. Is the sound good? Yeah, good, perfect. Um, I think everyone's used to that. And also, I think everyone's used to the idea that sometimes an army that has a specific composition works well uh, in various sizes. So, for instance, if I made only zealots, right, in small situations, in small army situations, that's going to be great. Like, if I have three zealots against maybe nine or ten zerglings, fantastic for the zealots. But if I was uh, having an only zealot army as Protoss, once I get to the maxed end, when I have an only zealot force, I mean, a couple of blue flame hellions, a couple of banelings, one fungal growth plus any ranged unit, it's going to just not be close in the slightest. So I wanted to point that out. Because um, most people will be aware of this. They'll make zealots at the start, and they'll begin getting fancier and fancier units. They'll begin starting to incorporate, oh, higher tech stuff. And you'll note that I haven't really commented on the game uh, too much. But again, we'll just look at the game and continue to listen to my soothing voice. So I, again, most people are familiar with the idea of adding uh, on more and more and more and more stuff. But there's a really important idea, which is the mid-game push interaction. Where, you know, Protoss will be building all his Stalkers and his Colossi, and he'll be gearing up to move out at something like 100 food. Pulling that number uh, just out of a hat. Let's just say it's 100 for argument's sake. And Zerg will, you know, around 80 food, begin really saying, what units should I make to deal with this 100 food push from Protoss? I know there's a 100 food push coming, so I have to build a big army. So Zerg starts building a big army of roaches. And all right... I think I'm almost ready to hold off the push. And then it looks like no Protoss is delaying until maybe 120. So Zerg says, all right, I have to keep making roaches. I must continue to make roaches. And this keeps happening with Zerg going, all right, well, I've started making roaches. I better keep on adding those roaches because a push is going to be coming any second now. And suddenly you are maxed with Zerg and you only have roaches. That's bad, because you basically have a mid-game army, an army that works well around 100, 120 food, except you're maxed with it. You have no more room to add in any fancy tech units, no infestors, no hydras, no um, corruptors, no broodlords, no nothing, right? You're just maxed out on roaches. And this is an increasing theme that I've been seeing in uh, Zerg vs. Protoss matches with the, you know, the, the Zergs essentially just going mass, 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 mass roach. And so that's going to be the big focus of today. So now let's actually talk about the game. Now you always hear me say things like "let's not oversimplify it," so let's not over or let's not overthink it. There we go. Let's make it as simple as possible. Let's not overthink what these players have been doing for the first four minutes and forty-four seconds. What did In Control do? He did a very fast cybernetics core and moved into the usual three warp gate. Would not be surprised to see him expand and only make sentries. Cool. Have totally summed up his play. Looks like Zerg wanted to go for an expansion, got pylon block, so he just delayed the pool and the gas a little bit. Went ahead and got the extractor out, and now has two queens and is getting gas as usual. Cool! Not too much overthinking going on. Don't obsess about the fact that a pylon went down and had to be killed. No big deal. No big stress. Everything is normal and good in the world of StarCraft 2. So Wing Control is going to be throwing down his pylon. Um, we're going to see, it uh, looks like a Roach Warn's going down. Relatively uh, normally timed lair. Drones being transferred. So I'm going to wait just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. I'm actually going to talk about Protoss briefly. I think everyone is familiar with this idea that Protoss is going to be making mainly sentries, mainly sentries, because it's so high on the gas and so low on the minerals, it saves up minerals to get down a nexus. Cool, we're at 6 minutes and 14 seconds. All right, this is now the point in time where it is so important to actually know where the hell you want to go, Zerg. Yeah! Because more often than not, 
people think about the game from the beginning. They just say, okay, this is my opening, and how do I deal with openings X, Y, and Z from him? All right, cool. I'm going to forward a little bit more. How do I deal with this, this, and this from him? So important that you just say, I eventually want three bases, a lot of roaches with two Evo chambers, upgrading plus one, plus one. Some arbitrary statement about what's going on in the mid game. Um, so what I really want to do at this point is watch what Sen is doing and try to think about where is he going, right? Where is he going with this? What is that big goal coming up soon? Well, it looks like he had some sort of deviation plan because here he comes swinging into the base. He sees one warp gate. He sees lots of sentries. And this is uh, something that's so important. People want to send in the scout to see one, two, three gateways. You don't really need to see that many gateways. Um, three gateways plus lots of sentries, plus not that many zealots. All those are pretty typical for this style of play where we end up sending this probe out to expand. So the fact that only sentries kill the overlord should be a big indicator to him. He should have a good sense of what's coming up. So we see him getting his Woch Warren down. We see only drones getting produced. We see two queens out uh, at the natural and one in the main. Just generally relying on vision. Hey, we get some roaches getting made and control moving out. Oh, yep, usual good jazz. Moves out, pops right back, doesn't want to get overrun. We're going to see a forge go down. Also pretty typical to get a forge and to not get a cannon. You get the forge, get the plus one, and allow yourself the possibility to get a cannon, but not necessarily so much. So now let's actually go into Camp Zerg, um, because really this is when we start to see the, the meaty deviations. I really want you to acknowledge the fact that nothing that significant has happened up to this point. Really, the Roach Warren going down kind of early, like around the time the layer starts, that's pretty typical. People like using Roaches for defense early on in Zerg, nothing out of the ordinary. People like getting layers pretty early on, nothing out of the ordinary. A lot of drones going on on two bases, nothing out of the ordinary. But now we see Burrow and Roach Speed. Okay, now we see a lot of Roaches getting made. So this is the first moment in time where I'm really going, Zergy, what do you have in store for us? Oh, Sen, you beautiful, beautiful Zerg, you... You stunning Taiwanese hero, let me know. Whisper your secrets into my ear. In control, getting more gateways. I'm going to be focusing less on in control at this point, and more on softball, a.k.a. Sen. Interestingly enough, softball is actually a talented Terran Taiwanese player, but this is the account that Sen has for the U.S. servers, and thus why he is playing under the ID softball, and not as Terran. So I always like this. Anytime you have units early on in this... Um, on this map, really. Try to take initiative to take out these destructible rocks. Yep, there's the plus one going down, yet no cannons. Just keeping all our sentry buddies in the front. Great softball. Wow, interestingly, continuing to make roaches. Getting some drones, but still emphasizing the roaches. And it looks like he's waiting for that burrow to finish. Now, for any of you who um, did not watch Sen's Game 3 in the round of 64 of the GSL, go watch it. This is an Excellent. That was an excellent, excellent example of using Burrow for defense against an all-in. Very, very good example of that. So let, let's see the influence that this has, because I'm, I'm going to say right now, I think everyone is aware that if you get a bunch of roaches and get up to Protoss and you Burrow on Burrow, you might win the game. But you shouldn't be going for the win there. That's That's... A huge difference. That's like a world of difference. Just because you can win there, people get addicted to winning there, right? What'll happen is you'll get a platinum level player who goes, oh, Roach Burrow Rush. He'll rush in there, he'll win a game, and go, oh, cool, I'm going to try that again. He wins again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And then on the 10th time, when he's in the diamond division, he's feeling awesome. He attacks someone, and it doesn't fail miserably, but it definitely doesn't win the game. The Protoss holds it, Zerg has to pull back, and at this point, a lot of Zergs will go, uh-oh, uh, don't really know what to do now. And that is such a great example of why you need to think about what's your goal, right? What's your goal? Three bases, two Evo Chambers, upgrading plus one, plus one for Maroches, right? That's simple goal, but a goal nonetheless. And if you don't have that sort of goal, you'll fall into this trap where you want to move out with a bunch of Roaches and pray for the win. So the big thing that I always want to ask myself, how does this influence the other player? How does this influence him? One very obvious influence is it means that this robo facility needs to be finished for him to actually be able to move out. Look at that, Burrow. Managed to take a few guys out uh, and really suffer no losses. Well, I guess the robot hasn't killed anything yet, looking at the kill count. 
But hey, again, look at the way he transitions. He's taking a third. He's getting an Evo Chamber. I saw getting constructed somewhere. Yep, there it is. Great. We see more roaches getting produced as well. Yep, there they are. Note that if this attack just consisted of these seven roaches, I think it's still doing a good amount of forcing of the opponent. It's forcing a Robo Bay down at the very least. Perhaps not a cannon, but yes, absolutely 100% going to be forcing a Robo Bay. A little bit sloppy by Sten could have been improved and I'm really going to be hyper aware of these production tabs I think that those are going to be pretty damn important to me all right making some drones still making roaches and it looks like we do see some more micro with the burrow going on I do think Sen is just being a little bit too sloppy there but I mean still the same idea idea that notice that we're still waiting for the observer to finish we're still waiting for the observer to finish and this was actually a pretty fast robo it's one two three four warp gates wow so most protosses are enjoying the five or six warp gate push style especially players like tt1 and in control but here no very very fast observer um and even then notice the game state right when this observer finishes you help me oh my god burrow ah uh, so right when the observer finishes Hey, we almost got an expansion done. Oh, cool. We even got this evolution chamber up. We're getting a hydralisk den. This is fan. This is a great spot to be in. An almost done third base. So let, let me just restate this idea of forcing, right? If I get in there with a bunch of, with just a couple of roaches with Burrow, could win the game. That's not the important part. The important part is most of the time he's going to have to get an observer really really fast and even if he gets it out really really quickly as in this game you still have time to get a third expansion started and finished whoa that's a very useful thing to know now again i want to also relate this back to the idea of what's just your general goal right that your general goal to have well three bases here's three bases let's say your goal in the game was i want three bases an evo chamber and hydralisks you could have just gotten roaches, killed this off, expanded, and then gotten hydralisks. You could have gotten a layer, gotten hydralisks first, and then killed this off, and then went back and gotten roaches. You could have, you know, expanded here, gotten zerglings, killed this off, taken this, and then gotten the layer, and then gotten roaches. There's a million to one ways to reach this exact state that softball is in. Why is it so important that you always have a goal that you can go for? It means that anytime you want to experiment with a new build, or you want to just try something out, or you maybe want to uh, adjust something in your regular play, you always know where you're going to end up. It's not as scary to experiment around, because you have a general sense of, well, even if I do do a Roach Burrow Rush or something nuts, I'm still going to be going for approximately this. So approximately this. Uh, ends up being that Sen used a whole bunch of roaches because he was getting a little sloppy. He unburrows, yeah, tries to do a little damage. A lack, it does not work out. So we see a, a good amount of roaches being produced right now. In control also, doing the smart thing, picking off all the overlords around his base. Do that as Protoss, for God's sake, do that. That is so important. Um, it's very easy to get in the mindset of, oh, I must rush to his base. Or just to kind of not take these overlords as seriously, but really, really you should do that. Now, I want to focus on this production tab a little bit. Right now, we're approaching mid-game-ish sized armies. I would probably say they're like 90 to 140 food. Uh, I'm kind of pulling that number out of my ass, but I don't know. It feels right. Not, you know, this is still kind of a small army. Maybe if we get a few more dudes in there, this will be about a mid-game-ish sized army. This is about when Zerg starts really being under the pressure of, do I make drones or do I make units? Or do I tech? How do I spend this money? Point control is killing this stuff off, but let's look at Zerg's production. Looks like Zerg did definitely end up getting this expo up, but oh man, is, it, is he feeling pressure? He's making all these hydralisks. He knows that all these units just killed off his burrowed roaches, so better get some hydralisks to reinforce. Look at the production still. More hydras, just churning out those hydras. And if we go back to the resource station, we note now that if in control does attack, looking at these two armies, this is going to win. Especially with the production that Zerg has and the creep. This is going to be able to beat this. Cool. A lot of times, this is the mindset that Zergs will get in. A lot of times, at especially the low and mid diamond levels, the Protoss will. 100% of the time attack here, thusly Zerg will 100% of the time defend here, and will as a result win 100% of the time here.
But the funky thing happens when, oh, gee, what if Protoss doesn't attack? So look at Zerg. Zerg is still in the mindset of, uh-oh, got to prepare for the push, got to prepare for the push. There's two Hydras coming out, four Roaches. In particular, there's no drones coming out. This is not super saturated. This is a good amount of stuff, but obviously these two geysers haven't been taken. We don't see amazing saturation here. Now Zerg's starting to get a little more comfortable. He's making some drones, getting another evolution chamber. Notice how big of a change that was. Only Roaches and Hydras getting produced. And now, Evos and only drones getting produced. This is sort of like that. Oh, phew, I have a pretty damn good amount of Hydras. All right, I'm set. All right, okay, okay, I'm good, I'm good. I'm noticing that he's not quite pushing yet. Let's actually take a look. Pause the game. I do this a lot. You should definitely do this a lot. Pause it and just take a look. What does Softball see? Not much, actually. So, really, his indicator to be making these drones on this Evo was probably just sending a unit or two up to this front or just sort of making this army and saying, all right, I'm at 137. This feels about right to stop making dudes. And especially having this burrowed ling here. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that just great? Oh, that's so wonderful. Ah, oh, that was delicious. Fantastic LA tap water. Two Evos up. Uh, all's pretty usual. Uh, uh oh, looks like we have Colossi coming out. Great, in control, still on. Four warp gates and one robo. A very good number of things to have if you are intending on taking a third kind of quickly. Um, and one thing to note again, Zerg snuck out a few drones. He snuck out a few drones. And now this is a lot of the time when Zerg's going, well, gee, if he didn't attack that first time, now he's got to be attacking kind of soon. So I better make me some roaches. I'm actually going to back up, and what we're going to do is we're only going to look at the production tab. We're only going to look at that for a little while. So let's maybe rewind to the 12 and a half minute mark, and you'll just see these drastic shifts where Zerg's kind of going, oh, defense, defense, defense. And then it's like, okay, I'll eke out a few drones, and then defense, 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 defense. I'm going to keep hitting my B button. B, 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 back up, back up, back up, back up. I would never dare remove my overlay. That would totally spoil results. All right, cool. Now, let's just look at production. Let's speed it up to times two. Yep, there's a lot of Hydras being made for defense. Hydras and Roaches being made for defense. Is that big mid-game push coming? Is that big mid-game push coming? All right, well, I'm about ready for it. Okay, doesn't look like it's coming. All right, let me sneak out a few drones. Pretty much every gold and platinum level player will not be building drones here. Every really good Zerg is going, well, I'm pretty safe. Let me sneak in a few drones. And watch how it literally is like a sneak in, right? He's making a few drones, all right. Maybe churning out 10, 15 drones or so. Not much in the grand scheme of things, considering the way Larva Inject works. Trying to poke around. He doesn't see this. And all of a sudden, when he starts to realize, yeah, you know what? There's no expansion here. That must mean he's just still building dudes. What does Zerg do? Zerg kind of goes, uh-oh. And now here's like 12 roaches just coming out right now. And here comes this concept of an overinflated mid-game army. Roaches and Hydras are very good in like the 120 food army size. Because everyone can get a good arc. All those guys can be fighting in the battle. Protoss doesn't really have that many guys. But now we see lots of roaches coming out. Oh my goodness, a spire's going down. An infestation pit is going down. And Protoss is, weirdly enough, not attacking. And I, I don't mean to imply that this is a mistake by in control. What I'm actually saying is that most Zergs are not used to this. Most Zergs are used to the Protosses who kind of blindly push because they can. Uh, and because they see other pros do it. But in control, of course, gets a good mix of stuff. And then kind of says, yeah, I'm, I'm not attacking. Now, this is the, the, the funky thing. If we look at these food distributions, we say, oh my god. Oh, Sen, he's at 190 food. Oh, in control, he's at 156 food. Oh, clearly Sen is winning. Sen only has roaches and hydrils. This big of an army of roaches does not actually function that well. So, what you'll see a lot of people do at this time is basically say, well, gosh, I better attack while I still have an advantage. Because notice that once you hit max, you cannot make any more guys. So that means if Protoss decides to just wait until he is also maxed, you lose. Because you have an overinflated mid-game army. No corruptors here, no nothing. So Zerg's trying to poke in there. And notice that Protoss is not really engaging. He is just kind of biding his time. He sees that this is a mainly Roach force. No reason to try to really rush down and keep his Roach count low. You never worry about keeping someone's Roach count low. You would worry about keeping someone's Corruptor count low, or maybe their Hydra count a little bit low, but you know, like, 
you don't ever want to try to suicide into that sort of situation. So this is what is very intriguing to me. This is, I think, the part where I lose most uh, if I am playing against a Protoss player. If, uh, who, who does this sort of passive thing. If I'm playing against a more aggressive Protoss, I'll have won the first battle and then feel a huge advantage. My Protoss opponent won't have taken a third. I'll feel in great shape, in control. In a spot like this, if I am playing against a Protoss who's in, in control spot and I'm Zerg, my army generally looks a lot like this and I have a huge amount of discomfort. Like, what is it that I do? So here's a big transition that a lot of Zerg players are starting to do. Just spamming spine crawlers. They can always help in a fight. Why not throw them down? They'll always be good. We see a couple of Corruptors coming out. We see the teching going down to the lair. We see the hatchery going down here at the right. But I'm especially, especially curious to see how Softball is going to be dealing with his maxed food army versus in control. So it looks like he is more than willing to just do, you know, good movement, sniping. He's uh, staying on his creep. Burrowing. He actually does have the burrow movement uh, upgraded. And it looks like he is making nothing but corruptors into this mix. So this is actually still kind of a rough spot because of the fact that uh, actually there should be more corruptors out somewhere on the map. Going to the unit counting station. Looks like, okay, there's three right now. 48 roaches. That's what I'm talking about, about that overinflated mid game army. And there's one more getting made. So it looks like he ends up engaging briefly. And it looks like when he's maxed, every time he loses a roach, he's going to replenish it with a Corruptor. Okay, great. Now, and that's a little weird to me, because there's only two Colossi out. I'm going to I, I'm gonna keep that in my back pocket. Now, I, I'm going to actually pause for an incredibly long time here, right? Upwards of like one minute. Because of the fact that this is a battle, um, people tend to view battles as like the exciting moment, right? It's like the culmination of all the decisions that you've made in the game. You know, it's like, okay, well, I was making only Zealots and Templar, and he was making only Lings and Banelings. Let's see who was right. Let the battle resolve this debate. Um, but especially here, when you're, like, teetering off that maxed food point, it's that moment that there's actually a lot of strategy. How do you end up rebumping your food back up? If we're, like, 150 food, like, if you're F Foxer, you know, if you're Marine King Prime, and you're losing your army, the only thing you need to remember is to make more marines, right? There's nothing sophisticated about that, right? But in this part, do you make more roaches? As we're going to see, lots of force fields and stalkers and colossi are fantastic against roaches. So just sort of blindly hitting the R key for no reason, I don't know, it doesn't seem so good. But likewise, if we replenish only corruptors, I'm getting a little worried about, you know, the fact that our Protoss buddy doesn't really have that many colossi. So I'm actually going to be watching what happens in the production in this battle very, very closely. So it looks like Zerg did maintain a pretty strong arc. Uh, looks like those Corruptors are the same original six that were being made. Yeah, and it looks like he's replenishing just Roaches and Corruptors. And if we look at the food count, we see that In Control is closing that gap quite a lot. Zerg's also pulling back. And I'm still, I'm still wondering to see how Zerg ends up making his way out of this. Well, hey, I noticed that there's this hive that has been getting produced this entire time. This is actually a very weird spot for Zerg to be in, because Zerg can't actually attack anywhere. There's nothing that Zerg can actually do aggression-wise to really get back in Protoss's face. So there's the Greater Spire going down. So I want to continue to slow down and sort of re-examine this situation. I'm, I'm increasingly aware of these spine crawlers here. I really think that these are going to be very important. Uh, yep, I mean, obviously doing just regular old damage, you can fall back there. Still repl re replenishing primarily roaches, only four hydras have really gotten into the mix. Has a few corruptors. Now, I take a number like eight corruptors very seriously, you know? If you're spamming a ton of roaches and you have like 48 roaches, in my head I just go, already right, spamming roaches. But if you have something like three roaches, or six hydras, or in this case, eight corruptors. That I'm really going to hone in on, because for me, that's not him just going, oh my god, Colossi, C, 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 just hitting the corruptor button as much as he can. This looks very specific, because now we're going back to all roach, all hydra production. And it looks like, oh, they're, they're using their vicious corruption, their plus 20% damage. 
I like to make fun of that ability because all the other abilities in the game are totally sweet, except for Corruption. You know, Corruption's like, well, they, they kind of have a fart gas that trails around them for 30 seconds, and it makes the, the, the army uncomfortable for a little while. Okay, well, that's fine. Let's just do that. Uh, one Mutalisk popping out. That's that's weird to me. I have no idea why. Still making these roaches, and it looks like very clearly no ability to be aggressive still. Is there some sort of ventral sack? No, nothing like that upgraded. I can tell you right now there's no Nidus Worm. Still waiting for that Spire. In control, doing the good RTS player style. I'm going to attack, and while I attack, I'm going to expand at the same time. Fantastic. And look at this transfer on the probe timing. Nifty thrifty. Well, actually a little bit early, but still, nifty damn it. So, this is um, not an actually real push that we're seeing uh, our Zerg buddy do. He's actually just sort of gently brushing up against this this army mix. And then, oh hey, looks like we see a lot of brood lords coming out. Uh, Dark Templar from In Control going to be able to do a, a good bit of damage. Um, and in maybe two minutes, in maybe two minutes, I'm going to say this now just so you have a little time to think about it. In about two minutes, it's really important that we think about how Sen got to this point with all these Broodlords. And why it's such a significant uh, achievement <laughs> on his part. So obviously, uh, Sen's going to do what every Zerg does, go, wait a minute, I have not thought about detection in any Zerg vs. Protosses for many years, so now I'm going to have to make like the first Overseer I've ever made in my life. Okay, there it is. Scoon its way over as this gets a whole bunch more kills. Uh, looks like more drones getting made. Okay, cool. Skirting right along, moving right along, waiting for things to hit kind of an equilibrium. More Broodlords getting made, still maxed. Okay, good. Okay, and... Yup! Right about then, I'm going to pause it. Looking at the resource station. Alright, cool. It's about about the same differential that we've seen most of the game. Uh, Protoss is about 30 or 40 food behind. Let's look at the Zerg army. Roach, Hydra, Broodlord. Hey, the Broodlord is a late game army unit. Great, awesome, fantastic. Now, I say it's a late game unit not because of the fact that it just is at the high end of the tech tree or something like that. It's the fact that it just operates well when it's in a maxed army. Um, now, most people will look at this and say, yeah, I was going Roach, Hydra, and then I went, and then I went Broodlords. And that's... Yeah, it's not exactly, it's not untrue, but it's not quite right, you know, it's it's not wrong, right, that's the, that's the, that's the condescending way to say, it's not wrong, it's not wrong, you're not wrong, I actually had a professor who did that all the time, uh, he would actually, he'd ask us questions, and when we didn't know the answer, he wouldn't actually tell us, he would just wait, and anytime someone answered, people would just be throwing stuff out, he'd be like, you're not wrong, and you're not wrong, and you're not wrong. All right, that's enough. Let me let me tell you all what's right. Everyone in the class had to be not wrong before I gave us the answer. So, apparently, I've I've been bitter about this for many years. I'm just sharing it right now. It's pretty important that you support me in my uh, in my in my misery. But anyways, let's talk about the link up that happened throughout the game, right? So, let's just first put a big stake in the ground for what we want to do with our mid game. We want three bases. Roach Hydra Mix, and one Evolution Chamber. Done! That's that's my entire description. That's all I'm going to do. That's it. That's the first thing I'm going to say. Always begin with that little mid-game plan first, because almost everything flows to a center point. So what Zerg did is he opened up with a Roach Burrow Push. Oh, cool. Kind of delayed this uh, attack from in control, because then he had to get an Observer. So this meant that Zerg could take a third base. Oh, fantastic. Looks like, you know, he's gearing up to follow that plan that he already just stuck a stake in the ground for. But I was so impressed with how he dealt with that being maxed in the face of this army, and the maxed army that Sen had was more of a mid-game army. It didn't have any of those good late-game useful things, had like no infestors, didn't really have that many mutilists, didn't have any corruptors, didn't have any hive tech at all. Like, like nada, right? It was just roaches and hydras. Um, so the Roach Hydra mix, this mid-game mix for Zerg, its big goal is to stay alive. That's the big purpose of Roach Hydra mixes, is, oh, you're going to attack me? Well, I have Roach Hydra, so pff, I win. That's its real purpose. Its purpose is not 
to engage in some huge battle at the Protoss' front to win the game. Protoss will be too well positioned. They'll have sentries and cannons and everything. Its purpose is not to do a big attack. Now, if he attacks you and you kill that attack, you can counter and win. That's fine. That's great. But the main purpose of that Roach Hydra mix is to defend against something scary that's coming at us from the Protoss front. So I love the way that he teetered. Anytime the Roaches got pulled down, he ended up getting a good amount of Corruptors, just around eight, and then straight back to the Roaches. Now, again, this is still a largely defensive force. Roaches, Hydras, and Corruptors. But then, any more food that he lost, he just saved to turn those Corruptors into Broodlords. Now, I want you to note that all that happened at the maxed zone, right? We get maxed with Roach Hydra. As we get pulled back, we replenish it back to max with Corruptors. And as we get pulled back, we replenish it back with Roaches until he's really backed off. And then we, when we get pulled back from max again, we replenish it up with Broodlords. Isn't that cool? That's kind of like slowly recycling lower units up into better units while still just kind of staying max the whole time. And Broodlords are what I call a, a push-busting unit. They're like the thing that allows you to crack a defense. Kind of like Colossi allow you to pick off all these spine crawlers from a range. Broodlords will allow you to deal with tanks well, bunkers well, cannons well, most things well. So that's why they work so nicely in the late game. So the way that Sen got here, I think, is so important. How he dealt with this big, scary army coming up by In Control. If In Control had attacked earlier, Sen would have crushed it. If a ten had Sen, or excuse me, if In Control had attacked, maybe even a little bit later, Sen would have crushed it with Roach Hydra. But the fact that In Control waited a really long time made it very, very scary. So now we're seeing Sen very carefully adjust himself forward. And now we have all these Broodlords engaging in the fight. Fantastic. I still have my production tab open because I want to see how Sen ends up replenishing. He replenishes in a very typical way with just Roaches. Because what Zerg does is they get max. They get, um, you know, around 3,000, 2,000, um, something like that. And do what I call 300 food push. Where they're maxed and they attack. And as they're attacking, they're replenishing insane amounts of fast, cheap units. So it can uh, wind back up to the front lines very quickly. Look at that, 333 of them coming out. And Sen is still maxed. Great, fantastic. And now we're seeing the real food differential go on. Look at this, 126 to 199. Can I just point out that for perhaps for the last 10 minutes, Sen has been maxed? He's been doing different things, but has been maxed. That's cool, right? That's hard to really work with that. I think... Everyone gets the idea that, oh, as Terran, I can open up Marines, and then get tanks and Marines, and then get medevacs and tanks and Marines. And that order makes logical sense, because the Marine part happens like under 60 food, and the tank part happens a little after 60 food, and the medevac part happens a little bit after 80 food, you know. So you always just have room to sort of expand your army, because you haven't hit maxed yet. But Zerg hits maxed really fast, and knowing kind of how to back off and replenish... So important. Too often you'll see Zergs just get Roach Hydra and be like, Well, I'm Max, but I guess that means that I'm fucking awesome. So I'm going to just attack because of this. And then they lose their whole army, are in shock, they hit the Roach button a bunch of times, and then Protoss whips around and attacks. And then a forum thread appears saying, Protoss Imba cannot win with Max Army. That's right, you can't win with a Max Army, Zerg. you got to win with a 300 food army, man. Look at him, Max, and still having more. Nibble, nibble, nibble. There, there's, there's all those 33 roaches. Is that actually exactly 33? Well, we're just going to go ahead and say yes, because that would be cool. And now we also see the purpose of these spine crawlers. These spine crawlers helped in this transition. Um, earlier on, when we had the Corruptors and we kind of wanted to get our Broodlords, we relied on these zero food units defensively, these zero food spine crawlers, so that way we could free up a little bit of food and a little bit of... Uh, yeah, basically free up a little bit of food, but not free up any safety, so we could get those Broodlords out. And of course, the Roaches come up to try to snipe the Colossi. This is nothing too fancy here. Gotta be careful, as Colossi are still awesome. Queen's getting in the mix. Yeah, getting all the range upgrades. Taking out the Nexus. Oh, so good, so good, so good. Softball, chillin' burrowed. Looks like he's gonna go ahead and lose one base in exchange for killing off of two. Uh, you'll notice that one is oftentimes less than two, so that was a good exchange for Sen. And we have a few more Corruptors coming out. 
Um, at this point, I would still not mind if he was continuing to replenish roaches, but this is probably still a better idea to get these corruptors. And notice how similar just this little theme is. I mean, yeah, there's all these brood lords and extra roaches here, but just look at this little mix here. A bunch of roaches and a small amount of corruptors, not like 15, but just like 5. Or earlier it was just 8, not too many, to deal with this kind of army mix, right? There's a little tiny mini example of Sen being smart. Looks like we have these queens deciding to do their own thing. Get the transfuse off! Get the transfuse off! There's a battle going on here, but oh no, the transfuse would have been sweet. It would have been awesome! There's a little nibble 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 going on with the Broodlords, playing so smart. Expanding to the opposite side, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And then, hey, replenishing Hydralisks again. Awesome. Now, a lot of times this, lo it, this looks so complicated, right? A new player will kind of go, okay, so I start getting Roaches, and then I get Hydras, and then I get Corruptors, and then I get Broodlords, and then I get Roaches, and then I get Corruptors, and then I get Hydras, and I have like just, just like a laundry list of stuff just sort of going on here. But it's the same sort of idea that in middle-ish size armies, Roaches and Hydras work really well together. Getting close to the max point, you want to get some Corruptors in there. And especially getting Broodlords in there. Really good. So anytime we're starting to get to a middle-ish range, look, we're around 150 food. We're kind of in a middle-ish range. Let's make some Hydras because Roach Hydra works good in middle-ish size armies. Cool. Cool. Nifty. Now this is awesome, just pinching everything off. Good luck, kangaroo luck to you, dear Frodox. Nibble, nibble, nibble. Nibble, 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 nibble. I hope everyone starts mumbling nibble to themselves anytime you see like a pack of broodlords. Just little broodlings. Just nibbling away. Just chewing. Yep, fantastic. In control, trying to pull back. Uh, trying to blunk out. But he cannot. Alas, he's getting nibbled. There's the long-range mining going on, and Sen appears to just sort of be having a very decisive win. Now, this really has the similar look to almost every other Zerg vs. Protoss, right? Except in general, that push that happened right here, that In Control did, where Sen was defending with these spine crawlers, that's where most Zerg players actually just lose terribly. We saw that Sen had very good calm control. Most Zergs that don't actually lose terribly immediately try to counterattack without having the patience to wait for the Broodlords. And there is the good game. Oh, fantastic. Wasn't that brilliantly executed by our superhero Zerg Sen? It was well executed. It was a trick question. Ah. So, ah. Again, the important thing to note, you don't have to be going Broodlords. You could do your Ultralisk stuff. You could perhaps be more aggressive. Uh, for instance, if you get maxed, right when you get maxed with your giant swollen mid-game army, if you start doing drops and pokes and prods, that's a very excellent way to extend the use of your big mid-game army that is a little bit too big. Uh, because you end up, you know, just poking through vulnerabilities in his defense. And then again, if he gets, you know, plummets down to 120 food and you plummet down to 140... You'll still remax the Zerg way quicker than him, so you can keep um, putting pressure on. So I like that quite a bit. Let's take some questions. Let's take some questions before I have to go to the State of the Game podcast. Yeah. Um, scrolling down. It looks like no questions have come up yet. Looks like there is some sort of delay in there. But um, no big deal. No big deal. So we'll wait for those to pop up as I uh, continue to ramble on endlessly. Maybe I'll just join in one of the other chat channels. Yeah. Uh, where are the questions? Actually, there might be some sort of severe lag going on. That would be awesome. Hmm. Yeah, you know, and Fear Dragon 64 says, I think by the end of this daily, we're all going to be about 20 minutes behind Day 9, and he's going to be wondering where the questions are. That's true. That is a true question. So you know what? If that is the case that it's lagged out, whatever. I will ask my own questions. So almost certainly uh, a very typical question is someone says something like, Day 9, what would what could have In Control have done differently? Because obviously when I talk about it from the Zerg's point of view, it seems so clear that the only thing In Control could have done was uh, lost the shit out of that game. However, what um, let, let's think about this. What could have gone a little bit differently? So... I think that In Control also suffered from a little bit of uh, his mid-game. 
His, like, over-swollen mid-game style. A lot of Protosses are sort of switching to Void Rays in the later stages because they know the Broodlords are such a significant threat, and that Roche Broodlord is pretty pretty typical. Um, having a few more transitions like that are pretty key. And, you know, honestly, not even doing something as drastic as Void Rays, but just getting, like, Templar works brilliantly. Works really, 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 really well. Uh, Void Rays are, you know, the best thing to deal with the Brood Lords, but, you know, having just Archons and Storm is great. Trying to pull your food off something like uh, mineral units, like Zealots, and dumping it more into gas units. Because, I mean, one Zealot costs as much food as one Templar. So for every Zealot that you pull out and Templar that you put in, you're going to have kind of a stronger, thicker army. One Immortal costs as much food as two Zealots. One Archon costs as much food as two Zealots. And that's something that you'll see really good Protoss players do, is right when they start getting maxed, they'll start getting more Archons and Templar and Immortals, uh, instead of just going Colossus Stalker. Colossus Stalker is great kind of as a mid-game force, but you don't want it too, too exaggerated. So something along those lines. Um, excuse me. Also, I'm... I'm curious about harassment. I, I do think that what I said about, you know, the transitioning to the more gassy units is, is kind of a standard in RTS games. Transitioning to the higher tech units, that's that's fantastic. Always. But the harassment thing, I'm not quite sure about. Just because no one really does it, so I don't have that much data to talk about. I mean, in theory, yeah, if you do a drop and you do a lot of damage, then it's good to do a drop that does a lot of damage. But that's not really a conclusion. It is quite circuitous. So I don't exactly like that too much but it might it might be reasonable i do think that in controls dt harass is pretty smart i think he could have pulled it off earlier uh, i also just want to briefly check on the upgrades um for protoss it looks like he was uh wow was actually doing pretty damn good on upgrades yeah so that was probably not an issue but just getting a few more of the tech units like more immortals and all that good stuff so i'm actually just going to make the announcements take one questions and then be done so tomorrow is Fun Day Monday. Submit a replay to Monday at Day9.tv of you attacking exactly every five minutes and only at those five-minute marks. You can do a little harassment antics and that sort of thing, but you must attack full-on frontal assault every five minutes. So that's at five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. That is when you attack. Uh, just make a good faith effort. I don't care if it's like, do I arrive at his base at five minutes or do I leave my base at five minutes? Just about five minutes. Just wing it. And every time that you send your troops forward to attack, you must type in a battle cry. Like, onward, soldiers! Just something awesome. Has to be different every five minutes. It's pretty important. Also, for Tuesday, go to Tuesday at Day9.tv to submit a game of you Terran players playing against a Protoss opponent where the Protoss early expanded and you tried to crack it as Terran but just couldn't quite do it. We'll be doing that on Tuesday. So let us take one more question. And then I'm going to go, because it's very hot in here. Um, Gravy says, Dear Day 9, if Protoss and Zerg trade armies in the late game, can P possibly come back given the rate at which Zerg can resupply? Yeah, actually, because I think that the Protoss have better units. <laughs> to be entirely honest, I think Protoss units are just way more kick-fucking-ass. Uh, like Immortals? Yeah! Templar? Dark Templar? Mm. Don't forget about the fact that Dark Templar do 45 damage base. When they're fully upgraded, they do 60 damage. They get plus 5 per upgrade. It's like stupid how much damage they do. They can, like, almost one-shot every Zerg unit. Yeah, I get some DTs in that mix. That's awesome. Like, that sort of thing. Um, depends on exactly how the trade boils down. But, again, like, for instance, if I'm Max's Protoss and I encounter a Roach Hydra Force and I somehow lose, Zerg's probably going to be not able to do much damage back to me because I can just have a few cannons, a few force fields, and a decent number of units for my resupply that I can hold it off, you know, like a 170 versus a 120. You can still do that as Protoss. Um, I mean, if he crushes me and you have a bunch of Broodlords, I'm probably screwed anyways and probably made a mistake earlier on, but yeah, totally. I absolutely think so. Just keep in mind that fundamental concept of when you are maxed, you want to be replacing your cheaper units, your cheaper, quick and dirty, easy units, with higher tech, fancier, gassy units. One zealot costs as much food as one Templar. So try to swap the zealots out for things like Templar, Immortals, Dark Templar, Dark Templar, and you'll be a happier person. So without any further ado, that's going to wrap up today's daily. But I'm going to leave the stream up for like 35 minutes because apparently everyone is lagging. Woo! See you later, guys. Peace, 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 peace.